Good morning, everyone. Those of you who, uh, I won't say brave the storm, but brave the mask are here this morning with us. And uh, I know that we have many people watching us online and in community. So welcome to those of you who are at home or unable to attend for whatever reason you are, near or far. And those of you who are near, welcome as well uh, as we navigate these challenging days. We are a praying people. And so God calls us to pray for one another. And so I ask you to look around the room, look around your home, wherever you are, and take a moment and pray for those uh, that God has laid on your heart this morning. Father, you have brought us here. Out of our homes, out of the day-to-day -day grind that uh, can often easily frustrate us, out of those moments when we simply want to be with you and be with one another. And I thank you that we can, near or far, here or gathered in our homes, wherever we are, that we could be together in your name, united in spirit and in truth, united in the simple and central message that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And for that, we give you thanks. We thank you that we can worship this morning now. For those who are weary and worn, strengthen them. For those of us who need a good word, encourage us. For each and every facet, we call out to you this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen. Amen. We begin this morning, worship in song. <clears throat> Put your hands where I can see them. This is a stick up. <laughs> I always wanted to say that. <laughs> Welcome here, all 12 of you. Please stand with us this morning as we worship together. But first, there's a couple things I have to say. I just got to get them out of my system. We have been practicing with masks. Oh, I'm already out of breath. And uh, now I know how a new modern vehicle with all the emissions and the EGR valves that has to suck <laughs> back in its own smog feels. So I have sympathy on the vehicles. And as we're practicing, <laughs> Doug kept saying, what's that smell? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's you, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, okay, we got that out of our system. Let's worship together. Thank you. 
this morning reading from Psalm 50, last chapter of Psalm. Go to Proverbs, go a page back. There you are. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and flute. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you'd like, you can uh, turn in your hymnals to hymn number 291. It is so sweet.
a couple of announcements. You will, uh, thankfully, there's no Lily this morning. Sorry, Lil, but uh, other Lil. That, but you'll see booties, and blue booties this week are good news. That means that Zachary Clyde Holstein has come into the world and is well and happy and healthy. Uh, I talked to also Raylene this week, and it sounds like Scotty and, uh, wait, I got it, Oakley. 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 Oakley, thank you. Scotty and Oakley are doing very well as well. So we're rejoicing in uh, their new little ones that have come into the world in these days. Uh, secondly, we had a, a financial meeting this week as we discussed next year's budget. And I want to thank all of you both here and uh, many of you online as well have been continued to be faithful and support the church. Uh, and we are doing well. I want to thank Bonnie as well for her contributions. But all of you, you've been gracious and we continue to be in a good place and continue to uh, have ministry here in our community and across Canada, which is remarkable when you think about it. And we want to continue to pray for our sister Violet as she continues through these days. Our brother Peter, who's not here this morning, uh, as well. So let's take some time to pray this morning. Father, we are called to give thanks in all things. Even when we would rather uh, mumble, you call us to rise above. So this morning we give thanks that we are here, that the sun is shining, that there is moisture upon the ground, Father, we give good, you thanks for your good hand upon us. Father, we give you thanks for these little ones, for Oakley and Scotty and for Zachariah who have come into this world strong and healthy. Thank you for their families and for the love and the care which they have received and they will continue to receive through all the days of their life. Father, this morning at the same time, there are those things which weigh heavy on our hearts in these seasons. We pray for kids going back to school on Monday and teachers and EAA and all the people that work in the school system. For the care center workers as they continue to provide love and good care and carry that burden. For daycare workers and those who work with little ones, grant them wisdom in these days as they work carefully with them. Father, we pray for our sister Violet as she continues to grieve. Father, may the peace that passes all understanding rest and abide upon her heart and mind through your great son, the king of peace in her life. Father, for Peter, as he continues to wrestle with his cancer, Father, we ask and we thank you for his good spirits, but we ask that you would strengthen him. And for Ken Sear, who continues to have infections in his system despite all his treatments, Father, we ask for what only you can provide, and that is healing upon his hand. Father, for all these things, so many more. We thank you for the generosity and kindness of people in these days. We thank you that we have resources that we can give, that you have blessed us, that our businesses are open, that we are able to work and have the strength and the wherewithal to do that. Father, we thank you for your provision upon us as your people in this place. And Father, for this day, in all things, we give thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before you start, it is a season, and today is the first Sunday of Advent. Hard to believe that the Christmas season is upon us, and I have asked Myrtle and Shirley uh, to come on up and light the first Advent candle and do the first Advent reading. What do I do, need to do here? Just turn it on. All right, thanks, Ken. Oh, yeah, there we go. There we go. I just got to swing the camera around. <clears throat> Expectation of Hope. Uh, the scripture is Jeremiah 33, 14 to 16. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at, and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it, it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. Burning on the pits.
Today we light the candle of expectation and hope. May it remind each and every one of us of God's great promise to us. He is our hope, he is our redeemer, and he is savior. Let's pray. Father, during the Advent season, may we be reminded of your promises to us and your fulfillment of them. Help us to prepare our lives for his advent within us. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Please stand with us as we continue to worship together. Speed up each time, so save your breath.
Be nice. I miss um, smiling at people and people smiling back. It's nice when you can kind of make that eye contact. It's easy in there smiling. But I was uh, talking to a lady this week and I said, you know that if you uh, stare into someone's eyes for more than three minutes, you'll fall in love. So you gotta be real careful whose eyes you stare into for any length of time this week. <laughs> We've been looking at wisdom. What does it mean to be wise? And uh, we turn from uh, the books of the Old Covenant, and we turn this winter to looking at uh, a new book. We look at one of the littlest books of the New Testament. This little book that we're going to look at in the weeks to come as we move through Advent and into the new year is 2,230 words long. It's not very long. It's barely a paper if you're at the university level. And it's centered on a 2,000-year-old controversy between two groups of people who lived in a very different world than ours. Let me describe their world and then see how their world connects with our world. Theirs was a world without electricity, no running water, no central heat, and no machinery as we understand it. Doctors, they were butchers. Water was too risky to drink and life expectancy was 35 for the average person. One in three babies didn't make their first birthday. And slavery was a way of life for many people. And governing and watching and ruling over all of this was one of the most powerful empires the world had ever seen. This empire ruled over 60 million people, spread out over a million square miles. An empire that demanded complete loyalty an empire who considered their leader to be a god on earth, and yet an empire that today we still benefit from. We still live under their laws, understand their history, enjoy their ruins, appreciate their food, walk on their roads, and their memory remains with us. The language of the empire has stayed in the English vocabulary. And yet, for all those differences, the issue at the heart of this book, and the reason that we're studying it and going to look at it over the next little while, is because the heart of this book is an issue that you and I wrestle with every morning when the alarm clock rings. I don't know what your routine is, but when that alarm clock rings, you wrestle with this issue. Every time you use a debit card, this issue comes to the forefront. And every time you close your eyes at night and allow your thoughts to drift or directed or guided, whatever you do, you will wrestle with the issue that is central to this book. Welcome to the book of Galatians. So take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Galatians. It's kind of uh, Romans, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, and tuck right in there. And while you're looking for that, I want to give you a little bit of the background to the book so we understand the, the set, setting or the context of the book. This is written by the Apostle Paul about 10 to 20 years after Jesus died. So it's relatively fresh in the New Testament. It's written to these churches that are in the Roman province of Galatia, which today would be modern-day Turkey. Um, and about 300 BC, a bunch of Gauls, or Frenchmen actually, uh, migrated to this area and began to establish cities. The land was given to them as payment for their mercenary work for the king of Gaul at the time. This is before the Roman Empire. But in 25 BC, as the Roman Empire swept and expanded, it absorbed this territory, and Galatia became a Roman province. But they weren't really that Roman as people. They worshipped the Phrygian sky god. His name was Sabosius. And we would appreciate him, for Sabosius was the all-powerful horseman of the heavens. And the symbol of Sabosius is this great man riding a horse, carrying a spear, and the horse is trampling the serpent god of chaos under his feet. These people weren't Jews, and they weren't Romans. They had a distinct culture of their own. 
They had their own language. They were more Greek and French or Gaelic than anything else. They were free, independent. They lived on the wild side. They might be Albertans, I guess. <laughs> Prone to violence, jealousy, fits of passion, and let's just say a liberal approach to human sexuality. They were governed by their history, their gods, their passions, and day to day by the Romans. And so the Apostle Paul goes to Galatia on his first missionary journey. And he plants churches there. And we're not going to read it, but he does this in Acts 13 and 14. He later visits these churches twice more on each of his journeys. We see this in Acts 16. 6, Paul and his companions travel to the region of Phrygia and Galatia. So we see Paul doing return visits with these folks. But they weren't alone in their culture or in their community. For their community was filled with people from throughout the empire including a large Jewish community. And it was to that Jewish community that the Apostle Paul went, spoke in the synagogue, and planted the church there. And a lot of the Jews and the Galatian people, these wild independent, as well as Romans and Greeks and all kinds, joined this community. Both the Jew and the Galatian came to accept Jesus as Messiah. The Jews accepted him as Messiah, and the Gentiles... Well, they accepted him as Caesar, their Lord and God. Simply what Caesar means, the Lord. So that's the setting. Let's take a look now at the situation. What was going on in this church that compelled Paul and the Spirit working through him, obviously, uh, to write this little letter, these 2,200 words. And Paul comes into this situation and he gives them great and good news. See, to the Jews, he tells them, Jesus is the Messiah. And to the Galatians, he says, this Sabiosis guy, this guy on horseback who trampled the world serpent, well, that's Jesus who's coming back on horseback to trample the serpent. And they would accept that. But in his message, he appeared to have left out a few key ingredients, like how do you live out this faith? What are the, the rules, the, the do's and don'ts of being a part of this new Jesus world, this way? What does it mean to follow his way? And so into this vacuum, some of the Jews come along and they have an idea. They say this, well, since Jesus was Jewish, what you really need to do is weave together the, the rituals and the ceremonies and some of the practices of ancient Judaism into this faith. To follow Jesus is to obey the law. And after all, there were a lot of laws. There were 613 laws. And you should follow them all at the same time as accepting Jesus as Messiah. And this causes problems. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. I'm going to read a fairly healthy portion because the story tells it better than I possibly could. Give you a moment to turn to Acts 15. Start, here we go. Starting in the first verse. Now, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you're circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you can't be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. These two verses are exactly what's happening in Galatia. The church sent them on their way. And they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria. They told how the Gentiles had been converted. And the news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and are required to keep the law of Moses. There's the tension. And the apostles and the elders met to consider this question. And after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. We're not going to read Peter's address. Let's jump down to verse 12. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul tell about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And so they're telling the story back and forth. Let's jump down to 19. And here's the decision. It is my judgment, therefore, 
that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them this. Abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from the meat strangled from animals and from blood. They boil all 613 laws down to just a handful. Verse 22. Then the apostles and the elder with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and sent them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, a representation for the church in Jerusalem. They chose Judas, who's called Marsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. Here's the letter they wrote. The apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. We have heard about some that went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them with you, with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we're sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols. This will become a huge issue in the book of Corinthians. From blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You do well to avoid these things. Farewell. <laughs> That's the entire extent of the law. So let me summarize this. There's a collision in Galatians between the law keepers and the freedom folks. Does this start to sound familiar already? The law keepers say, obey the law. And the freedom folks say, i got to be free. Don't step on my freedom. See, there's one more issue in the book, though, that will be huge in the middle, or in the beginning. That is, the law keepers are undermining Paul's authority. They're saying, this Paul guy who's preaching freedom, who is? He's not an apostle anyways. Paul, you, you talk about freedom, but you have no authority to back that up. Best go back to keeping the law and ignoring this Paul guy. So into this mess, into this conflict between those who say you must keep the law and those who say don't trample on my freedom, comes the Apostle Paul, comes this little book. I trust you're seeing the connection already to our world. It's a very simple little book, three little sections. Chapter 1 and 2, Paul defends his apostleship. Chapters 3 and 4, Paul defends faith as the way to God outside the law. In doing so, he shows the purpose of the law. And then in 5 and 6, he just gives some practical guidelines how to live in faith. It's a very simple and beautifully structured book. It begins with a greeting. Paul, an apostle, sent not by, from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me. Paul says, greetings, and it ends with the word, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters, amen. So, that's the entire book. But let's take a look at the third portion this morning, and that's the message. There's the situation and the setting, the outline. Now let's take a look at what the book contains. See, because at the heart of this book, excuse me, is the question you answer when the alarm clock goes off. It's the question you answer when you use your debit card, and it's the question you answer when you go to bed at night. And it's the question that is crucial to us during this season we find ourselves in. The question that Paul is addressing and the question that you answer and must answer is simply this. Who governs your soul? Who is in charge? Who oversees? Who makes the rules? Who or what supervises your soul? We're all governed by incredible number of forces. We can be governed by our own desires. The alarm clock goes off in the morning, and what governs that decision? So this morning the alarm clock goes off and you say, you know what, I am so tired, I'm not getting out of bed. You can be governed by your own needs. Many of us are governed by our employers. We gotta get up, we gotta get dressed, we gotta get clean, we gotta get the day done. We can be governed by all kinds of things. We go to the bank and we, or, or, we spend. What governs your spending? Our own needs, our desires, our wants, what governs marketing, advertising, all the forces that govern our spending. And at night when we close our eyes, what governs our thoughts? The anxieties of the day, the word of God, our thoughts, our kids, our worries. Every day we make decisions 
And we rest under the governance of other forces. And so the Galatians, these Gauls, they were governed by their passions and their desires. These are fiery horsemen. This event is so important that Paul actually addresses their passions. He says in 5, 19 and onward, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Is that a great word, debauchery? Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. The reason Paul says all this stuff is because that's what was going on in their lives. These are the forces that were driving them. He says, I warned you like I did before. So these passionate people were driven by the passions of their lives. But the Jews were different. They were driven by the law. Paul addresses that as well in verse 23 of chapter 3. Before the coming of faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up under the law. So both these groups that Paul is addressing are groups we're familiar with. We can be governed by law or we can be governed by passions, by desire. And both of these groups had cruel taskmasters over their souls. The law is unrelenting, immovable, a harsh taskmaster. That hard line that says you cannot step across it. You can only eat certain meats prepared in certain ways. You can only eat food prepared or cooked by Jewish people. No non-Jew could prepare your meal. But the Galatians, they were different, driven by unchecked passions, rage, jealousy, hatred, and anger. Well, you know anger is a ceaseless taskmaster. My brother once said, all men are like steel. Once they lose their temper, they're no good. <laughs> you can be driven by passion, just as unrelenting as by law. To be ruled by law or to be ruled by fire never brings us peace. And so Paul's little book wades into this issue. Who governs your soul? He introduces a radical new idea. Freedom. But not the kind of freedom the Galatians were used to. Not freedom that, as Paul would say later on, as opportunity for the flesh not opportunity to run wild, but freedom to hear the Spirit. Freedom to walk by the Spirit. Freedom to love your neighbor and love your brother. Freedom to obey the Spirit. This is Paul's great message that we're going to explore and expand as we work our way into this book. For the freedom is the message of the Gospel. Freedom to live by the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit in faith. We'll explore this and so much more in the coming weeks. But for today, we ask that question. Who governs our souls? You see, we're at a season in our life and in our culture where this question comes to the forefront for many of us. We are governed by the necessity of work. We have to get up in the morning with that alarm clock. For self-employed, whatever, or the boss plans our day, the necessities of life rule over us. We have to work. We're governed by that need. But let me ask who rules our thoughts. We turn on the radio or our phones or read the news in the morning. What ideas or images rule our thoughts for the day? Who rules over our souls at night? Are we governed by trust or by fear? Are we governed by joy and yes, we can be governed by grief. Anxiety or peace, insecurities or hopes. We know what it's like to be governed by grief, to be governed by anxiety, by sorrow or by depression. Many of us will bear testimony to what that life can be like when those forces govern us. And we can be governed by pain as well, both physical and emotional. Difficult master pain. There are seasons we go through pain as our master. But eventually we cry out for a vote of non-confidence and look for a new leader. Don and I were talking this week and thinking, when was the last time I didn't have a day or she didn't have a day where pain was not a part of that day? I can't remember a day, she said, where I didn't hurt 
We know what it's like, you and I this morning, to live in constant pain. But to be ruled over that is hard. See, we can be ruled over by laws or by traditions or passions or our fire within. This is the issue Paul is addressing and why it's so crucial. Who governs our soul? But this morning, let me share with you very briefly a different ruler. A better ruler. One who is not so cruel. Turn with me to the book of Colossians, not Galatians, for Colossians is written by Paul and by the Spirit. Just one little verse in Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Some of you might know this by heart. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to a deed which you were called in one body and be thankful. When we hear that verse, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, we might think of, of peace as kind of a feeling, kind of a, oh, I won't try that, but, uh, you know, kind of a, I'm at peace. I'm at one with my world. I'm at peace if I were sitting on a bench, perhaps, or on a hillside, and, and this wave of peace comes over us. We think, finally, I am ruled by peace. But that's not actually it. And this is the part where studying history opens our eyes. That little phrase, peace of Christ, that was a huge word. See, because the Roman Empire, which ruled everything that Paul walked under, these million square miles and 60 million souls of Paul's day were ruled by the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was ruled by one phrase, Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And the peace of Rome ruled the empire. It was a political, military, economic policy and practice. Pax Romana ended war within the empire. Pax Romana created trade routes, commerce, even mail delivery. It gave the empire law and order. It settled disputes between people and provinces and countries. Pax Romana provided security and stability. Pax Romana put bread on the table of all the citizens of Rome. It ended fear. Where Pax Romana ruled, you didn't have to worry about barbarians and outsiders. You could live and prosper and grow and build a business, raise a family, and eat at your table without fear. Pax Romana was called the miracle of Rome. It wasn't some nebulous Nirvana-like statement that the empire experienced. Rather, it was the rule of a powerful force that changed everything, from commerce to comedy, from food to the fantastic creations of the Roman Empire, all ruled and governed, all created by Pax Romana. So what does the Apostle Paul on the influence of the Spirit do? He changes one word. He says, not Pax Romana, Pax Romana. Christos. And those who read that word, it would be a political statement, a powerful statement of authority. No longer Pax Romana, now Pax Christos. Not the peace of Rome ruling over you, but the peace of Christ as his rule and reign over us. Not the miracle of Rome, but the miracle of Christ. See, the peace of Christ isn't some, simply an emotional state. Yes, it has emotional components. But it is the rule and reign of the King of kings and Lord of lords over every facet of our being. And as Pax Christos rules over us, we flourish under his hand. You see, where Christ rules, there is peace. That's why he's called the Prince of Peace, the King of Peace, as it is. Now, we can't do much about the rule and reign of Christ. But he gives us our part, and this is the remarkable part. The last part of the verse says, and be thankful. That's our part. We can be thankful. We can have a heart of gratitude. And this morning I want to let you in on a great Christian secret. Where gratitude is present, peace rules. Where there is gratitude, peace rules. Gratitude and fear are very difficult to fit in the same room together. Interesting. As we study this whole idea of what gratitude does to us, more and more research is pointing to the very truth that Paul spoke 2,000 years ago. Sonia Limbrowski wrote this in her research on gratitude. 
Gratitude is many things to many people. It is wonder, it's appreciation. It is looking on the bright side of a setback. It is fathoming abundance. It is thinking about someone in your life. It is thanking God. It is counting your blessings. It is savoring. It is not taking things for granted. It is coping. It is being present oriented. We find in positive psychology research, gratitude is consistently and strongly connected with greater happiness. People who are grateful have a greater sense of wholeness and happiness. Alex Korb writes this, the higher levels of gratitude are associated with better sleep and lower levels of anxiety and depression. Gratitude brings peace. And so what does the Spirit tell us? He says, be grateful and let the peace of Christ rule. To live a life of gratitude. Time and again, psychologists and researchers are reaffirming the wonderful truths that the Spirit spoke so many years ago. That the King of Peace is robed in gratitude. Let's pray. Father, cause our hearts and minds this day and in the days to come, when we are frustrated, when the weight that we carry upon our shoulders causes us to wonder. Father, I pray that your spirit would lift our hearts and minds and souls and strength to a place of gratitude. The sun has risen, the snow is upon the ground, our community is well. Father, when we're frustrated with our family around us, we remember those who don't have family. Cause us to be grateful for the gifts that we have been given. Father, we thank you for this church. We're grateful that we can be here this morning, whether physically present or electronically there. Father, we're grateful for your hand upon us in these days. Lift our spirits that you may rule and reign. May Pax Christos rule and reign over us all. And in his name and by his authority we pray. Please stand with us.
Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless.